Okay, hello there. I'm Sean Wilsey, geology professor at the College of Southern Idaho. Today is August 10th, 2020, and I thought I'd put together a little video uh, to go over some of the recent earthquake activity over the past few months here in Idaho, uh, precipitated by uh, the magnitude 6.5 quake, which you can see on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the map here in this teal green color. So this is the location. Uh, if you're if you haven't, hadn't heard of this, this was March 31st of this year. It was a magnitude 6.5 quake uh, located about 20 or so miles northwest of Stanley, Idaho, which sits about here. Here's Redfish Lake, uh, kind of a, a famous landmark for some perspective and context. And this was a pretty good-sized quake that had a, a good region of the Intermountain West shaking. People felt it. Um, of course, it was right during the sort of the crux of the pandemic, so that just kind of added a little bit of uh, a little bit of insult to injury for a lot of folks um, but anyway um, I wanted to kind of show you what's been happening since then many people know that we've had aftershocks since that uh, fairly large earthquake and so this is a map showing all the earthquakes of any magnitude uh, since March 31st you can see the primary uh, main shock event here uh, the magnitude 6.5 and then all the earthquakes that have happened since that time. And there's upwards of 1,600 earthquakes that have happened from March 31st uh, to today, August 10th. So this is typical of earthquakes, is that we have, uh, for an earthquake this size, we would expect to have not just hundreds, but literally thousands or so, or even thousands, and there will be thousands by the time this whole thing plays out, of earthquake aftershocks that uh, occur. Remember, earthquakes occur because uh, stress has built up uh, along either side of some fault and then when that stress exceeds the strength of the rock the rocks fail they break the energy is released as an earthquake and then after the big earthquake um, you change the stress conditions within the rocks considerably and so there's lots of smaller earthquakes what we call aftershocks that are adjusting to the new uh, stress regime so all these rocks have been changed in terms of the stress that they've experience and that's caused all these smaller earthquakes to occur after the big one here. Uh, so this is typical, this is nothing out of the norm, uh, but because people uh, have felt them in this part of central Idaho, um, it's you know a little bit newsworthy and it's, it's, it's caused some people maybe a little bit of alarm, but it's nothing to be alarmed about. This is very typical in terms of the number. Um, I did look at how many earthquakes had occurred sort of aftershocks by month. And so within the first month of the main earthquake, there was about 665 aftershocks. The next month, there was about 330. The next month, about 369. And then this past month, uh, basically all of July, there was about 230. So the number of aftershocks is decreasing. Um, but the most recent aftershock, I, don't, I probably can't find it in here. Um, it's buried in here. But the most recent one, uh, actually, I do know which one it is. It's this one right here. It was a 4.2, so the teal dot here. This is Stanley Lake, so just west of Stanley Lake. There was a 4.2 aftershock on Friday, August 7th, um, and this one was felt by people in the Stanley region, so this is of a large enough magnitude to be felt by people locally. Um, all these quakes, no matter which one you pick, they have very shallow depths, so of course the shaking is hitting the surface fairly soon after the earthquake occurs, so that makes it, uh, again, more likely to be felt by people. Um, but this one here, again, was, was felt, and you know, just a reminder that these aftershock sequences uh, will continue. Um, what's maybe interesting to me, um, and maybe to you as well, is that if we go back to the primary earthquake here, the 6.5, and we look at some fun science-y information here, so if we we take ourselves down to this funny looking beach ball symbol here. This is what's called a fault plane solution um, based on how the earthquake moved initially. And so what this tells us, this weird sort of beach ball shape uh, symbol here, this tells us that the way the earth broke and the fault that produced this earthquake on March 31st was a strike slip earthquake, meaning that the motion was sideways rather than up and down. And so it's more similar to what you'd see on the San Andreas Fault uh, than what you might see in other places. And this was a little bit surprising uh, to geologists because the faults that were known in the area 
were, um, were known to have uh, up and down motion rather than side to side motion. But of course, side to side motion um, is possible as well. It's just accommodating uh, all the stress. What's interesting is that if you look at a lot of the aftershocks, including this one we had uh, last Friday, and you look at uh, the little beach ball symbol for that, you can see it's a different looking symbol. This actually indicates that the motion was up and down. So, and it was on a, a fault that was uh, aligned kind of east-west-ish, as opposed to uh, the big fault, uh, which was north-south-ish. So what we have here is, is uh, you know, again, 1,600 aftershocks. And what it's sort of revealing is a couple, a couple possibilities for the location of the fault. The way geologists find faults is usually by one of two methods. One is by having lots of earthquake data, and sometimes it takes the earthquake to find the fault, uh, which is sort of proving to be the case here. Or in other places, we can sort of see evidence that a faulting event has occurred and, um, on the surface by looking at landscape and features on the surface. The problem is in central Idaho is you have this incredibly complex topography covered with a lot of forest, and so it's hard with aerial surveys or photographs to actually see where the faults are. There um, has been some new techniques. Uh, in fact, I think in 2010, Glenn Thackeray down at Idaho State University, they were able to map and definitively sort of pinpoint the location of the sawtooth fault. So there's actually a fault that runs uh, north-south-ish along the base of the sawtooth. Everyone had always suspected, because it, the sawtooths are so much higher than the valley there the, that the Salmon River runs through, that a fault was responsible for that relief, just like the Tetons or something like that. Um, but they weren't sure exactly where the fault was or how active it was, and they were able to use um, this very uh, sophisticated technique called LIDAR to actually figure out where that fault was. Um, they had mapped the fault uh, about up to here, just maybe a little bit west of Stanley Lake, somewhere in here in this mess. Um, but the earthquake that we had in March was actually further north, um, possibly um, indicating that the fault continued further north. But nonetheless, you can see by the arrangement of the, the aftershocks over the last you know, five or so months, six months, uh, that the earthquakes are defining uh, a pretty strong north-south trend. Uh, and so it does, in, it does indicate that we have, um, if it's not the sawtooth fault, then some other parallel fault that's running kind of northwest, southeast-ish through this area. There's also a secondary trend of uh, aftershocks and earthquakes that kind of runs a little bit east-west-ish through here. So that could be indicating that there's a secondary fault uh, that's aligned this way. Uh, again, it's still early to say. Um, of course, we all want answers, and, and in science, it just takes time a little bit. And so we're analyzing this data. Folks are trying to figure this out, and you know maybe it'll take this entire aftershock sequence figured out. But it does look like we have um, some sort of uh, um, fault that runs uh, north-south along the sawtooth, as we suspected, and possibly a secondary fault that, that is uh, east-west that kind of intersects it at some, at some angle in here. So um, kind of interesting. So um, what it may be indicating is that uh, possibly the first event was on a, a, a strike-slip fault. Maybe the sawtooth fault actually moved sideways or possibly there's another fault up here. And then the other possibility is that the later events of some of the aftershocks, if they're all on the same fault, which we don't know for sure, are producing up and down uh, what we call normal fault motion, uh, which is pushing the, the sawtooth up and pushing the Stanley Basin down. So uh, perhaps that's kind of interesting to you. And I want to show you a couple other things here related to this. So uh, the reason I became pretty interested in this is as a rock climber, uh, there was a big event that happened uh, in the mountains immediately after um, this, this earthquake. So there was actually uh, people that were camped up there, 